This is episode 15 of The Investor's Podcast, and this is our second part interview with Guy Spear. Broadcasting from Bel Air, Maryland, this is The Investor's Podcast. They'll teach you the basics so you can lay your business's foundation. They'll teach you in steps so you'll never get lost. They'll give you actionable investing strategies. Your host, Preston Pish and Stig Broderson. All right. I think, uh, Hari, I think you're up with, and we'll get some uh, investing, uh, hardcore uh, accounting uh, investing questions going here. So, Hari, go ahead and kick this one off. Sure. Uh, so, Guy, uh, the chapter 11 uh, about checklist in the book was very helpful. And thank you so much for generously sharing your checklist, especially it helps for somebody like me who's just starting out because it's uh, it's really, I think, checklist comes out of experience. And somebody like me who has less experience um, doesn't have any anything to go on uh, or to start with. One of the lines that caught my attention and I, I kind of noted down in your book was that you mentioned that we can't use the brain to override the brain. And that was profound to me. And the reason being, I had read this book, Think Fast and Slow, um, where uh, the author, Daniel Kahneman, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, talks about the system one and system two and how system one works against us because of the heuristics that it forms and uh, shortcuts it takes. And when I looked at uh, some of the checklist items that you have, like, you know, don't trade during the uh, market hours or uh, don't sell a stock uh, for at least two years after uh, you buy it. If it goes down in value, you're basically applying your principle of like, you know, countering the system one. And that was very helpful. My question um, about the checklist was, how do you assess the quality of uh, management in terms of integrity and competence? Are there checklist items that you would share with us or insights that you would share with us by reading, say, the 10Ks or 10Qs? How would one go about uh, figuring out the competence of a management? You know, uh, just uh, uh, before we get into it, um, what's so interesting for me is that, I mean, I, I didn't, first of all, the, the checklist was developed by Monish. He's, and I, I, I'm not trying to be falsely modest, he's, He's way smarter than I am, and he's an incredibly, he's got an extraordinary mind in that, you know, if you look at that, the, you know, those rules of uh, don't sell a stock uh, for at least two years after you've purchased it, or don't trade during market hours. I, uh, Harry, I was sitting with, with Monish in, I don't remember the hotel, it was a hotel in Delhi, and I was asking him how he dealt with, you know, these kinds of difficulties, and he gave me he said he gave me these two rules and you know my jaw dropped to the floor i was like that is so obviously right and and in, immediately after that the next thing i thought was why the hell didn't you think of that guy i mean that is not such a difficult thought to have uh, and that's what's extraordinary is that his mind sort of finds these things which the minute he says it it's like oh my god that is just so obvious so uh, and I would tell you that it's the same with the development of the checklist. And I think, what, again, what I find interesting, and this is not, we'll get to the direct question in a second, but, um, you know, in, in the Talmud, this is a sort of book of Jewish lore, um, it, it very, a lot of emphasis is placed on crediting ideas to the person from whom you heard them. And I, I had... I didn't want to usurp anyone's ideas as my own. And what I find fascinating is that I, I think I take sufficient pains in the book to show the reader that, you know, these ideas are not my ideas. They're primarily coming from Monish Pabrai and some other people much smarter than me. But isn't it amazing how, or I find it amazing that when you truly attribute and give credit to where the idea came from, you know, you guys are interviewing me and you're treating me as if they're my ideas, even though they're actually, I learned them from somebody else. So, um, and uh, so that, that's just an interesting, interesting observation to me. In terms of uh, uh, assessing the quality of management, I think that I don't have any, any simple, obvious answers other 
then uh, I do think that over time, the more time we spend with the materials produced by public companies, the more um, uh, I, I think that sometimes it's obvious and sometimes it's just a feeling that we get. And I think that I, I think of a time when I saw Warren Buffett used to speak to a group of uh, investors collected together by Morgan Stanley when uh, Alice Schroeder was an analyst at Morgan Stanley. He would appear on either the Thursday or the Friday night and answer Q&A at a Morgan Stanley dinner. And <clears throat> he was talking about Freddie Mac and he talked about how he'd sold Freddie Mac and he talked about how he was looking at some of their securitizations and he noticed some things that didn't make him feel comfortable. He felt like it was time to sell. I think that that's an example of a mind that's extraordinarily well attuned to sort of these minor things that just make you go, well, why would they do that? And if they're doing that, what else are they doing? And I don't think there's any substitute for just time spent reading any reports. But it's time spent reading any reports intelligently. So one is, um, uh, you know, I imagine, I don't know. And that story really stuck with me or that event really stuck with me. I think it's quite likely that somebody would have said to, to Warren Buffett, oh, you know, Freddie Mac um, uh, or Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, the quality of their securitizations is going down. And that thought would have been planted in his head. And then he would have gone and, and look, he would have been a little bit more attuned to looking for that to see if he could see that with his own eyes. So I think that sort of in a, in a very, um, we have to integrate signals that we're getting from all sorts of places. And when we don't know an awful lot and we know that we're not very knowledgeable, which is a great strength, by the way, Harry, is I think that to go after the world's great investors and to try and see what they saw. So to look at every single investment that Warren Buffett has made and try and see what he sees. So I would tell you that this is absolutely current. Um, uh, so there's there's a company called CBI, Chicago Bridge and Iron, and Berkshire Hathaway owns 10% of it. And um, uh, there's a short seller who's who's squeezed it. Well, it's not squeezed it, sorry. He's just shorted it, and he's written a report that's taking the share price down quite substantially. And this is a an, an accusations of uh, by the short seller of bad accounting, misleading accounting. So this is just a fascinating Petri dish because you've got Warren Buffett owns 10% of it and you've got a short seller. So you're saying, you know, let's read what the short seller is saying and now let's try and understand what Warren Buffett saw in the company because he would certainly not have invested if he uh, didn't feel like the management, 10% of the company, he feels the management is incredibly solid. So what signals is, is, is Warren Buffett getting from the company? And what signals is the short seller taking? And then to try and sort of get a triangulation of what we ought to be looking for. And I'll just give you one other example of that is, you know, so, so I was really in, impressed, not in a positive way, by how Warren Buffett just sold Tesco uh, recently when these accounting problems came up. And so you get, again, a really incredible example of this is a guy who's well known not to sell companies just because they're down. So what is it? It seems very likely that uh, something about the accounting revelations made him completely reevaluate the management. And I don't think that it provides any simple answers, but it provides clues, very significant and simple clues as to how this one great mind thinks. And then I just think we need thousands of those examples. We just need to keep building them up and keep learning. Uh, but there's no short answers, basically. And I would tell you that that's a shortcoming of so many management books and how-to books because the nature of writing is that you have to tell the reader two or three big ideas. Otherwise, it's not an interesting read. And what if the, you know, God is in the details? What if the answers is actually in many thousands of details? It's just not naturally, uh, you can't naturally write a book about it. It would be a very boring book that wouldn't sell. And so much knowledge that ought to be captured is not captured in uh, the literature of business because it's not doesn't make interesting reading i guess so uh, the thing i took away from from what you said guy is really that it requires a lot of research and a lot of uh reading and i mean you really got to do your homework you just can't say oh yeah i looked at a couple things and the management's good 
<laughs> and then just kind of move out. It it requires a lot of maintenance. It requires a, a lot of due diligence on the part of the investor yeah. to continually look at that. Thank you, Guy. And uh, uh, you always say the God is in the detail. And thank you for kind of you know not uh, oversimplifying it. In fact, uh, I have made mistakes where uh, I read in this book, uh, Give and Take. Adam Grant talks about uh, how giver CEOs would have smaller pictures and uh, the taker CEOs would have like you know, big pictures in the annual report. And then I started looking at a lot of companies I'm interested, like, you know, I saw HP, like, you know, Mick Whitman has a whole, like, you know, uh, one page picture, uh, whereas even um, Mitra, Mitra, like, you know, uh, Jenny uh, from IBM, she also has a big picture. Then I was like, you know, uh, then I thought that's stupidity because, <laughs> I'm kind of, you know, looking at the trees, not the forest. And thank you again, like, you know. Yeah, um, but, but two two things, I think that's really interesting. I mean, so, the, the, so one last idea here is that I think that, you know, I learned that writing a book is a team effort. And I think that any way you look at it, the way I look at it, examining and learning about companies is a team effort. And the question is who we have in our team. So, you know, if our team is a bunch of sell side analysts, that's really bad. But with all of the greatest respect to Adam Grant, he is an academic. He's not an investor. So it's a cute idea about the size of the photographs, but it probably is not significant. And I'm not sure that I want to take my ideas about how to evaluate management from Adam Grant. Uh, and so it probably is not a useful, you know, it's, it's more confusing. It's maybe like reading charts. It may be. There may be certain charts that may be helpful, but by and large, you're better off not looking at them. But so, so, you know, there's nothing wrong with, I think if you have a really sanitized uh, uh, group of friends, and by sanitized, I mean that they're, they're people who are not grinding an ax in one way or another. And that doesn't just mean that they're not sell side analysts. That means that they don't, don't, you know, they don't have an ego that they want to prop up. They don't have a need to prove that they're right. There are all sorts of reasons why somebody might uh, not speak honestly and openly about what they saw when they, they looked at something. But to get, you know, somebody like uh, those those engineers at Google, Rishi and Sarab, when you say, hey, what do you think of this? You know, and then ideally those people have an awful lot of experience is, is a valuable place to take it from. And, you know, I would tell you, learn about management from Adam Grant. Don't necessarily learn about how to read annual reports from Adam Grant. But. <laughs> Okay. All right. Great discussion. Um, okay. So, uh, Guy, I got to tell you, I thoroughly enjoyed this discussion that you had on owning the uh, Tupperware stock uh, because it led to kind of this deeper discussion of value creation and win-win relationships in society. And this is something that was really big on uh, the Charles Koch book that we read, uh, The Science of Success, where he talks about the same thing of how can I add value to society? And I just, I really found that amazing that you highlighted the same exact discussion and, and you talk about how you came to that conclusion in your book. Uh, is this something that you can describe just in brief the, the story from the book and how that really taught you this, this fundamental aspect to your now investing philosophy? I mean, so, uh, you know, it starts off with uh, me reading in one of Charlie Munger's speeches about how the Tupperware parties are a lollapalooza of, um, of these psychological uh, effects that, that um, make it possible for Tupperware to be so successful. So being the person that I am, I then went and ordered up the Tupperware annual reports. They arrived a few days later. Uh, I was orgasmic because this was a company with huge margins and a very, very high return on capital. And I just thought, my God, this is an awesome business. I need to buy it. And I raced out to buy the stock. I think I even wrote a letter to Charlie Munger saying, oh, I'm so excited that you talked about it in this speech because here I am and I own Tupperware. <laughs> I think Charlie Munger would have seen that letter and he would have yawned. He said, oh, God, <laughs> what a misguided soul. Uh, so there I am. I'm all excited. I own Tupperware. I, I went down to their... Um, the uh, um, investor relations meets down in Orlando a few times. And the guy who runs the company is an incredibly charismatic, very great guy, Rick Goings, who, by the way, responds to every note that I write to him. 
he writes a note back to me, so I would argue that he's a giver. And, you know, two or three hours later, every time I'm expecting earnings to grow, but some region in the world uh, is not doing well, and sales are just not growing, and I just, you know, it, it, it's obvious now, but I just couldn't figure it out, and I can't remember exactly what it was where it finally dawned on me that uh, you can buy uh, containers that do exactly the same job that Tupperware does uh, in all sorts of places now. And this is pre-internet, so you couldn't buy them <clears throat> over the internet, but even then you could buy them in all sorts of stores for half the price. And it just took me time for the penny to drop to realize that this product was very, very highly priced. And we have a very highly priced product that's very, very hard for you to grow sales because you can only by creating this lollapalooza of Tupperware parties where you have all these effects combining, can you convince people to pay so much money for your Tupperware? But in any normal circumstance, that's not going to happen. At the same time, and this is an example of what doesn't make it into the book, I owned uh, shares in a company called RLI, Replacement Lens Insurance. Uh, based uh, in Illinois. I don't remember the town in Illinois. It's not in Chicago, uh, but one of the towns in Illinois. And I was attracted to this company by their extraordinary combined ratio. So they had a very, very, very profitable underwriting operation. And I was so excited to own this because, you know, as Warren Buffett says, the key, the key for an insurance company is to do profitable underwriting. And these guys were profitable. And again, premiums just did not grow. And it took me a long time to realize that the reason why premiums weren't growing is that, you know, everybody knew RLI will offer these excess and surplus lines insurance. Uh, but you only went to RLI when you couldn't find the coverage anywhere else because they would, you know, with the greatest respect to RLI, price gouge you. So you would just, you know, people, people did business with them when they had to, but they were never going to come back with more unless they were forced to. And that wasn't a good recipe for growth. So um, that said, you know, it's, it's not like I lost money with Tupperware. It's just that I invested a lot of time and energy. It could have been, you know, I could have invested probably over the same period in Berkshire Hathaway and made a lot more money. So That's what I say um, about every pick I, that I don't pick when it's Berkshire. <laughs> <laughs> it's, great. It's, it's a very, very high bar to beat. You know? It's a bar that's available in the stock market every day. So I, I think that... But then this idea of if you if you then compare and I think that moving back and forth, you know, what am I doing? What's Warren Buffett doing? I started to see the pattern that every I feel like I mean I don't know if it's true to say every single one, but so many of the Berkshire building businesses have this model where they've created something that they can do for lower cost than anybody else. And so it just become you become the natural resource or the natural place to go to for it, whether it's reinsurance or whether it's um, NetJets or whether it's Geico, they're all based on this idea of we're going to drive costs out of our system so that we're the lowest cost operator. And when you can provide something uh, that's, uh, that you, st you can profitably, profitably provide something to the market at the lowest cost, you have an extraordinary formula for business, and that's Geico. You know, this goes to a common theme that we've talked about in some of the other books that we've done. When you see these managers that that rack and stack their interests in the right order, and what I, you know, Stig and I obviously argue is the right order is customers first, employees second, shareholders last. When you rack and stack it in that order, and that's where your focus is, it's a it's really difficult for a company to not be successful unless they just got a bad service or a bad product. Um, when they when they think in things in those terms, and I mean they try to they need to try to balance it as much as possible. But if they have to actually prioritize what comes first and what comes last, that's how it always has to go in order to have a long term success of a business. And you know, just your comments remind me of that, and it's really refreshing to hear. Yeah, and that's what you know. I have a book now about IKEA, and that's what IKEA did. And I think that what's what's also very interesting about those kinds of business models is that it's very hard to make them successful very quickly and in a short period of time and up front. You have to work at it for many years before they start becoming successful. So again, they're the kinds of businesses that reward people who are willing to build now 
or willing to invest now for a, for, a, for a great future down the road. And so you get certain kinds of people, who are people who are capable and willing to defer rewards who populate those kinds of businesses. And it, it all also really reminds me of the Dando investor. Uh, sorry, Harry, if I don't pronounce it uh, correctly. Uh, <laughs> I've actually been practicing. <laughs> but uh, Monis Pabra's book, Dando Investor, where he keeps talking about having this mode. And I actually think he also uh, talks about Geico. Because even though everybody can see what another company is doing, like, for instance, Geico or a company like Walmart, it's simply impossible to clone because you don't have that competitive advantage you don't you cannot you know do it as cheaply as they can and that's yeah. really the key to uh, to a long term uh, yeah a long term mode so so now just to loop this back to a previous thought so you know uh, we as individuals and or people with small businesses have an incredible advantage over people with bigger businesses at, at least most businesses other than some of these companies like Costco or Geico which is a so in a certain way, this sort of goodwill strategy is um, a marketing strategy, but it's a marketing strategy that is predicated on doing something for five years before you see any reward. And if you go to your management in a, any kind of business and say, look, I've got this great marketing idea. It's, this is what's going to happen. We're going to have these costs for about five years, and then rewards ought to start coming through you'll be laughed out of the room. The most that a management team is ever going to give you is maybe 18 months. It's like, if you can't show results in 18 months, then, you know, sorry, we can't do this. And that means that there's a skew in the world away from these kind of very, very long-term goodwill creation strategies that the vast majority of people just cannot follow them because they're caught in an environment which just doesn't reward it. And that means that we can follow those and, and we have the potential to, to we, we have a huge advantage over the people who don't see it and over the people caught in corporate environments. And I would argue, I'd like to believe that every single one of these businesses like Walmart, Ikea, uh, Geico, Costco, the people who started those businesses started with the very same ideas of this goodwill creation. Or if we look at the uh, Rose Blunk and Nebraska Furniture Mart story, she was not concerned about how much money she was making. She was concerned about, as you were saying, uh, Preston, delivering value to the customer. And she never thought about how much, but it took decades, or you know, at least a decade before the benefits of that really started flowing through. So what, what's amazing about this is that when I understood this, when I understood what Nebraska Furniture Mart was about, there was a part of me that wanted to go out and buy some furniture business in Brooklyn and see if I could recreate Nebraska Furniture Mart in, uh, in, uh, in New York City. But, of course, that would have required a lifetime of dedication, and it was not my path. Okay, um, the next question, and Guy, I really had to apologize because that's actually also about Monish Pabrai. So please, uh, as, as I look down this uh, sheet here with the questions that we sent you beforehand, I can see there are so much evolving about your good friend Monish. So I, hope, I really hope that we don't offend you by asking so much. Uh, you know about what we got to do, Stig? We've got to get uh, we've got to get Guy to bring Monish onto the show. I think. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and then only speak about Guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There you go. I like that. We can ask uh, we can ask Monish questions about Guy. Yeah, sure. I have I have no problem with you asking me questions about Monish Pabra. In fact, I've learned so much from him that you're asking me questions, even though I've written much about him in the book helps me to to reinforce those lessons so so you you shouldn't apologize at all okay guy that's nice to know but one thing that i learned from your book is that uh, monish sometimes calls you up with an, an uh, investment idea and says hey guy what do you think about this is that something that we should invest in uh well the first of all it must be really nice to have someone one of the best investors in the world call you up and say this is my smartest idea, this is completely inside knowledge, do you want to invest with me? That was the first thing I thought. But then the next thing I thought was, so sometimes you must feel that this investment pitch is outside your circle of competence. So even though that you get like the best knowledge from the best investors, uh, from the best investor, sometimes you must reject this investment pitch. But how often do you do that? Or am I completely wrong in my thought process here? So, uh, I, I would start off by saying that I, I don't think that uh, 
Monish Pabrai needs Guy Spear to see if something is a good idea or not. And he's certainly not pitching these ideas to me. Uh, he, it would be more like um, he's curious, I think, to see how this individual, Guy Spear, with his particular requiring, reacts. So I think that you know the way to imagine what is going on is is you know the, the investment idea is sitting in a in, is is some kind of reagent, and he wants to see how that um, investment idea interacts with that quantity that is Guy Spear, and he mixes them together to see what happens. So he's uh, he's extremely independent minded. He has. Um, you know, no matter what Guy Spears' reaction is, he may or may not make the investment. Uh, so he's, it's really, I'm just a sort of a, I would argue, a jar in his lab. And he's like taking the investment idea and pouring it into that jar and seeing what color it turns. So, okay. so that's, that's what's going on, just to give you a sense. And, and I think that, what you know, he, he understands the way I'm wired and knows that I'm wired so differently to him. So there are things that he doesn't feel very strongly that I feel a lot more strongly, and he's curious to observe uh, what, what, how that plays out with me. Uh, and I would tell you that, so there are, there are many circumstances in which I have an utterly, um, uh, I, I have a violent negative response, but that doesn't stop him from investing. <laughs> and, and, and sometimes I, I see it and sometimes I don't. I don't think I feel bad about that at all. I, and I don't feel bad about the fact that uh, I think that he's capable of taking much bigger bets when something is, a clear, is clear to him. And even if something was as clear to me, I'm just not capable of taking as big bets. And I think that uh, I struggle with that for a certain period of time. And I don't struggle with it anymore because, you know, it's, it's about being authentic. And I have to, I'd rather be, uh, a true version of myself and have lower returns and have an inauthentic version of myself and have higher returns. So, um, yeah, so he's, he's not pitching and it really doesn't matter what I think. And yeah, you're absolutely right. In certain cases, I just can't. Uh, and it, there, there are some cases where it's the other way around. I mean, I, I think I knew him quite well. I took a trip to Brazil and ended up investing in two for-profit education companies. They did very well. He had no interest for one reason or another. I mean, and I think that, um, so it's not as if, and I don't think that, the, so, so it's, this idea of pitching is not, a, is not a good analogy, and this idea of going into an investment together is not a good idea. He's using me as, his, his, as, as just a sort of a test tube in a lab to see what color I turn when he pulls the idea in. And he absolutely doesn't need me to make the investments or not to make the investments. He's capable of doing that on his own. But, but I just give you one last idea on that, is that, um, you know, I, the, the, is so, so we talk about diversity in the United States. And what we're really looking for is not, when we look, we're looking for diverse teams, it is not, uh, you know, physical diversity. We're looking for cognitive diversity. We're looking for people who think very differently. I think that what, what we should be looking at for in our investment conversations is um, there's some qualities that you want. You want discretion. You want people not to talk about what you're talking to them about. Uh, you want intelligence. You want them to be uh, to have a low ego, so they're not trying to prove anything to you when they respond. But then I think you're looking for somebody who thinks differently, who just thinks in a different way, who sees the world in a different way, because that 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 contrast provides some value. And uh, and you know, and then it's sort of like to go away and say, huh. This is the reaction that this person had. Let me try and understand why they had that reaction. And there's a, there's a lot of learning in that. So, all right, uh, uh, Hari, you got the next question. Go ahead. Sure. Um, so, I would like to um, share with the listeners of this podcast that um, apart from uh, Guy's book, his letters to the investors of Aquamarine Fund are a fascinating read. I believe there are three letters uh, posted on the website. And one of the ideas I, I got out of uh, that, the letter of 2012, I believe, um, is the idea of um, uh, Hydra. Uh, Hydra is an organism that grows uh, two heads when one of its head is cut off. This is basically um, 
where guy is explaining nasim taleb's idea of anti fragility it was a great read um my question is related to that um uh, in that uh, and as well as in, uh, in his owner's manual uh, guy you talk about um, uh, being an hydra uh, in the investing world that is being resilient uh, however um, individuals like us who are not really full time investors um are fed um uh, or even um scared um uh, by media and the investment gurus about either great depression on the one uh, side of the spectrum or the coming uh, um um hyperinflation um and we are usually confused as to uh, what should one do so i wanted to ask you um uh, to share your advice um with individuals like me uh about how to manage their personal finance and life uh to position themselves to be anti fragile or hydra as you put it in your um letters so you know it it's, it's you know, if when you figure out the answer just let me know please <laughs> no, i'm figuring it out as well but so so very genuinely i mean i think that there's no there's no easy or short answers and i am figuring it out and and i don't have you know again i don't have one bullet that sort of that sort of deals with it all uh something that i a subject that i don't understand very well but is so fascinating to me is how life exists you know i i was telling my dad this morning of how i i saw biochemists were at my undergraduate college walking around with biochemic biochemistry textbooks and they'd be studying um chemical pathways in the cell and the way these chemical pathways were presented is as if just you know it's one one loop that exists on its own and it was a real revelation to me to realize that these chemical pathways it's really better to think of networks of chemical pathways and and so it's very hard to predict what one chemical pathway will do because you have they exist you know you can have um uh, uh conclusions which are not obvious and one example that michael critchin talks about in one of his books is this idea of forest fires which is now well known where originally forest tree services had this idea that if you just uh if you just put out full forest fires that was the right thing to do it turns out that you know it's counterintuitive that allowing small forest fires to burn is is uh, prevents um uh larger forest fires and now i know that this is related to your question yeah so so when you come to 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 the hydra of the investing world i think that all i can tell you is all sorts of things that i know it's right to do at the margin in order to improve the probability that we will be able to seize upon opportunity when the world falls apart if and when the world falls apart so you know a few really important things <clears throat> improve the term as for me it's to improve the the terms on which the capital is sent to me so if the capital is can be called away from me in within 3 months i behave very differently to if the capital can be called away from me in 1 year and that would be very different if the capital is never called away from me which is what Berkshire Hathaway has so those are sort of like three different stages and you could go even further that um you know the the, the capital that Berkshire Hathaway has to invest the insurance capital is completely uncorrelated what's key about that leverage some people say well Warren Buffett has leverage it's just called insurance float but the point is that 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 leverage is not dependent on the capital markets it's dependent on events in the real world and so it's completely uncorrelated with the financial market so if you take that to individual investors the absolute key is to not feel like i'm going to need the money anytime soon to literally be able to just not think about it and then uh you know and if if you if you want to take that one step further if 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 uh if there are all these talking heads that are telling you to worry about fly hyperinflation you might want to turn those talking heads off and but that and as a conscious desire to improve your environment basically uh so i think that there are just you know, dozens if not hundreds of these micro decisions that one has to take to gradually improve who we are and i think that if i come from the perspective of a marine fund what i need to do is look for pound capital it's not about becoming bigger it's about improving the terms on which capital is sent to me 
And obviously, Monash has gone and done that in a very big way by doing down to holdings, which is a permanent capital vehicle. Um, you know, I think that the, the best place as an individual investor is to work on who's got a call on our capital and why. Uh, and then I would tell you on the hyperinflation side, this is just me speaking, I agree that, that I fear that not because I listen to talking heads, but because I see the size of the central bank's balance sheets. And my answer is every single investment that I make has to be inflation protected. And just to give one example of that, my MasterCard and Visa take a sort of a percentage slice, minuscule slice over every transaction that passes through their system, but it's a nominal slice. So as prices go up, their revenues are completely tied or indexed to inflation, if you like. And, and you could argue that the money sent to banks are also indexed to inflation. So those are a few of the things. But, you know, my, as I wrote in the letter, my goal is, it's my goal. I haven't fully figured it out. If I'd fully figured it out, I probably would have written that down. One other thing I'll tell you is that all the letters are on the website. So you can go back and you can actually see the progression from, not so well written letter to much better written letter as you go through. It's just, you can download them all basically. Don't laugh at the early ones. <laughs> I had a follow-up question for that. Um, when you're, uh, you categorize uh, what is anti-fragile and what is fragile, and you list a uh, concentrated portfolio under fragile. And um, I was a bit confused because uh, Charlie Munger uh, and Warren Buffett advocate concentrated portfolios. And I wanted to know your thoughts on why you consider it as fragile. Oh, that's it's such a such a painfully, too painfully easy question for me to answer. So when I went into the financial crisis of 2008, pretty much the vast majority of my um, assets were in four stocks. And uh, one of those went down by 95%. And another one was American Express that went down by like 80%. So... You know, there's no question that the way I was structured, having a concentrated portfolio in 2008, was fragile. And if it wasn't for some other aspects, dynamics of the sort of system that I was a part of that were anti-fragile, like father and family who stuck with me, uh, and and me having some relationships that helped me to focus on the long term, I think that it's possible that I would no, no longer be running Aqua Marine Fund. And so I, I would still argue that. In terms of Nassim Taleb's terminology, I think that uh, a concentrated portfolio is fragile. It's more likely to show on extraordinary swings in value, and unless you have other elements of your game in place, uh, that could that could result in an end to your business. Mm-hmm. So, Guy, I mean, are you uh, seriously contemplating uh, starting a holding company in the in the future? I mean, that's from from your comments. That's how I that's how I took it. To be honest with you. I mean, I think that it's a logical place to want to go. I, I think that what, what I just tell you, though, is that I, I don't think now is the right time for me. I think I'm a little bit, probably a little too focused on promoting my book uh, because, you know, it's sort of my baby. But, uh, and that's sort of where my mind is at right now. Uh, I would also argue that I have, a, I, I'm... A, I have, you know, the nice way for me to put it is I have a different skill set to Monish Pabrai. Just because I'm, um, you know, I'm an okay investor, I've delivered good returns, but I think there's a much broader set of business skills that are required to have a holding company. You have to be able to um, raise the money in the first place. You have to be able to manage people. You have to be able to pick people. I mean, I, my higher fire decisions right now are relatively simple because it's, it's a bit like just deciding whether I want to own the stock or not. Uh, when you get into close contact with management, it's a whole different set of skills. It's something that I would just tell you, I think that I think that I aspire to it, but I think that I have to be honest with myself and um, accepting that I may not have the skills to do that well. All right, guys. So I got the uh, last question here, and I stole this question from uh, Tony Robbins because I, it was such a good question. If you weren't allowed to leave your children any financial assets when you die, only knowledge, which book outside of your own uh, would you bequeath to them? And can you summarize two or three of the main points of, of the book? I mean, I hope that I'm not doing a cop out here. 
Uh, but you know, I, I'm, I'm Western educated and all of those good things. And I, I have to say that I just think that the found, a foundational text for us uh, in, in, as Westerners is the Bible. And not, not for, you know, and I'm talking about the Bible as literature and not as a, not as a religious text. I just think that, and the, the, so the, I didn't have three reasons, but I had two reasons. Um, and the one is that uh, I think that the overall uh, message that the Bible gives is what we as humans do counts on some level. And it's, it's not about whether or not you believe in God or whether you want, not, you want to be a religious person. But I think that uh, I, I saw a movie recently, um, uh, Interstellar. And, you know, it asks some really important questions about what it means to be human. And we live in a world where increasingly uh, you can start asking ourselves with the rise of machines and software heating the world, what is, what is the role for humans in a certain way? And I think that this, this basic idea, which is fundamental to our humanity, that what we do is important on some level, what we do counts, is, um, uh, is something that I would want my children to live with. And... Uh, you know, I, I was looking at all this. So, in a certain way, I, I think that the scientific quest is a, is a, is a, if the only reason why you'd be curious about the natural world is if, on some level, you came with this perspective that it matters. Uh, so, so for me, that that's one lesson that the Bible imparts. Another another lesson is that history has meaning, and I think that if you want to live a purposeful life. Um, there are many philosophies that sort of say, well, history doesn't have meaning. It's just one eternal cycle and you just keep going through it again and again. And I somehow feel like to have children in the world uh, who, who feel like, well, their individual lives have meaning, has a meaning. And then the story that we as humanity tell has some meaning that we may not, cannot figure out right now, but it has a meaning. It's not pointless for me. It's, now, that may be overly philosophical for, uh, uh, for, for your audience, but... Or for this conversation, but when you said one book, you know, I can't say the intelligent investor. I can't say it's got to be something that that hits, you know, our lives and all its profundity. And then what I would just tell you, and again, I hope that this is not a cop out or it doesn't sound like I'm being uh, highfalutin. Uh, I have gotten so much out of just two or three Shakespeare plays uh, that really have touched me to the core and. Uh, one I quote at the very beginning of the book, this uh, Hamlet. I think that, you know, that Hamlet is one of the most quoted characters in all of literature in any language in the world. And uh, Hamlet is just this extraordinary figure. And I think that when, when just by exposing ourselves to a few Shakespeare plays, I think that I got exposed to uh, just what a, the, the broad range of human experience. And, and I think that there's, a, there's somewhere somebody did a study that showed that if you read literature, a lot of it before a certain age, you become better at understanding what people's motives are in real life because you have just a richer um, base to draw from. So, so the number one for me would be the Bible, but not for religious reasons. The Bible is literature. And the second would be, you know, some or all of the works of Shakespeare, if you allowed me a second, second bite at that apple. <laughs> um, I, I love the response and I and I love the authenticity uh, guy and it, it's it's exactly like your book you know as people go out and, and read this book they're going to see exactly what we're talking about and what we're referring to throughout the interview um, so what I want to do real fast at the at the very end of the show we always uh, read one of our uh, questions from our audience so our question this week comes from Michael Valentini and he writes hello Preston and Stig I personally feel buying solid companies run by a competent management will lead to solid returns over the long term. However, I have very difficult time determining what a good price is and determining the value of the business. Do I use a discount cash flow model? Uh, garbage in, garbage out, he says. Do I use relative multiples? Do I use a balance sheet to value the appreciating uh, equity? What makes a stock an obvious value? You know, applying Buffett's rules of buying a wonderful business at a fair price. I understand there's no definite correct answer, but I'm very confused about the whole topic of valuation and would love any insights that you can afford. So I'm going to give two quick answers, then I'm going to uh, open it up to the floor. So I think the first thing that I that really kind of reeks out of security analysis is this idea of finding a company that's stable. 
Whenever you find a business that's stable, you're able to see trend lines. You're going to be able to have a little bit more trust into what the future might hold for the business. So that's the first thing I'd highlight as you look at uh, potentially using a discount cash flow model or anything else is find something that's stable. That's going to give you a, a lot better uh, predictability. And the next thing that I'll tell you is that it's not always something that you can stick on a intrinsic value calculator, discount cash flow calculator or anything like that. And so I've got a story from the uh, shareholders meeting uh, during this past uh, year uh, where a gentleman stood up and asked Warren Buffett. And for anybody who's never been to the shareholders meeting, um, what happens is, is Warren Buffett basically answers questions for hours on end. And he gets some really intriguing questions from different people. And there was this gentleman who stood up and he started asking uh, Buffett about his Burlington uh, Northern investment, which encompasses about 20 percent of the overall Berkshire Hathaway company. Uh, when you look at the equity and this gentleman stood up and he, he started on this really long question and he, he started off, he says, you know, uh, Mr. Buffett, whenever I take the net income and I add in the depreciation and I add in the amortization and I add in the uh, non-cash items minus the deferred taxes and the minus the capital expenditures, the discounted future cash flows only yield about a 3% return. And I can't understand why you continue to own this company and make large capital investments in the business. And after the, after the guy asked this, you know, really long question, everyone in the audience, and there was like 30, 40,000 people there at the meeting, everyone just erupted into laughter. And what was amazing was Buffett's response. So Buffett, you know, his immediate response to this gentleman was, you know, I really like this question and you had it going so well right up to the very end there, because we really like to immerse ourselves in that equation that you mentioned, which for anybody who studies Buffett a lot knows that that's his owner's earnings uh, equation. And so what Buffett did is he took the audience and everybody in there was, was pretty much laughing at this poor gentleman in this question. And he had a, he had really truly did have a, a fantastic question, but Buffett, you know, told the gentleman, Hey, it's not always about the numbers. Okay. You can do all those hard math problems, but what we see is something that's a little bit more unnoticed by the general public. And what he, what Buffett and Munger were seeing in this Burlington Northern pick was that the company has the potential to grow and expand throughout the U.S. And this isn't something that you're going to see that's tangible on the balance sheet or the income statement. This is something that the business can just naturally do because of the market size. And so what I'll tell you is it's just not that simple. And I guess that's the answer is you have to immerse yourself. And it goes back to some of the, the answers that Guy was providing earlier. You've got to do a lot of research. And if you're investing in individual stock picks opposed to an index, You've got to prepare yourself to do that hard research and truly understand and be able to detect that value that might be going unforeseen by so many other people. And then you have to have the, the trust and confidence in yourself in order to stand by the pick. So long answer. I apologize that that was so long, but I want to open it up to the floor to see if anybody else has some other comments. I would be interested to know guys' uh, answer to this. Well, uh, so, so, so funny answering in terms of Warren Buffett, just... If we just uh, talk about um, uh, Burlington Northern for a second, I think that what, what I find so extraordinary about um, those railways is the, the, the rights of way. So, you know, uh, I, I owned uh, for a period of time this uh, gas pipeline business. And what was extraordinary about that gas pipeline business is that once you own a right of way uh, and then there's somebody who needs a gas pipeline built, if you own a gas pipeline that's anywhere in the neighborhood of where the connection, the, 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 the new gas pipeline needs to go, you have an inordinate advantage because it's not so much just owning the assets, it's owning the right of way. And uh, creating a right of way, a place to put your pipeline, can be extraordinarily expensive if it goes through any kind of major urban area or anything like that. And I think that when you look at Burlington Northern and you realize that rights of way that were relatively inexpensive to acquire 100 years ago are now surrounded by real estate and, and it's just impossible for anyone else to build that. You kind of have an asset that is, is potentially infinitely valuable because just nobody else can create that. So, uh, you, know, you know, how do you, you can't do that by looking at the accounting, counting numbers as Preston said, it's, it's sort of seeing that and saying, oh my God, this is incredible. And there's only one way it can go is up is the United States becomes more built out, the, the, the value of those rights of way goes up. And I think that those kind of one-way type equations where it only ratchets up, it never ratchets down, 
is a great thing. But I would tell you that um, uh, another piece of Warren Buffett's behavior that I just found really telling in terms of this question is uh, when I saw him buy uh, Goldman Sachs during the financial crisis. And so you ask yourself, how was Warren Buffett valuing Goldman Sachs? And at that time, there were so many things going on. There was so much unpredictability. It was hard to be able to predict much about what Goldman Sachs business would look at, look like, let alone, you know, what cash flows. And uh, I mean, they were, they, were, they, they were converted into a bank at one point. Uh, I don't remember if that was before or after Warren Buffett made the investment. There was talk about them having to get rid of all of their um, uh, trading division. And so, you know, I think that, so you look at him and, and what is this in terms of valuation? He's saying, Warren Buffett is saying, we're pretty close to maximum pessimism. Uh, and um, all of these things are trading cheaply, including Goldman Sachs. Uh, and um, uh, so, so, so maximum pessimism, and I'm buying the business with the best reputation and the best brand name. And so there's a, there's a certain amount of holding your finger in the air and feeling the wind I think in a lot of these things, but I think that over time, what's happened to me is that here's, here's the phrase that I think that I want to be most wary of, or I tell people that I need to be most wary of when, when they hear of an investment idea and then they say, oh, I just need to get comfortable with this. And if you need to get comfortable with it, then it's not cheap enough, you know, but I, I think that there are certain things that just, just hit you in the face and they hit you in the face over time. So, um, you know, I'll just give you one example. Uh, so you have you have all these automobile companies, and in general, automobile companies seem to trade across the cycle between 50% of revenues and 100% of revenues. And I'm not saying that one should value an automobile company in terms of percentage of revenues, but when 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 Fiat comes along and it's trading at less than 10% of its revenues, that's sort of eye popping, and you sort of sort of then start drilling down and ask what's going on. And I think this idea that it just has to jump at you. And this, it's a bit like finding love. Uh, you know, a guy comes to the side of the dance floor and he says, well, you know, I want to find love, but I just don't know how I'll know it when I find it. And the answer is, it doesn't happen on the night where you happen to be wanting to look for it. It happens when you least expect it. And when it does, it'll jump at you in the face. And I think that's, that's true for, uh, for investment opportunities. All right. That's some uh, amazing insight. I love the last example there, Guy. That's that's awesome. So, hey, uh, this is all we have for today. We cannot thank uh, Guy come, for coming on the show enough. I mean, this was just amazing. We are just so thrilled. We've been really anticipating this interview. So, Guy, your time to, to give us a two-hour interview, we cannot thank you enough. And I know our audience is just eating this up. So, really appreciate you coming on the show. Well, I just want you to know that it's, it's such a pleasure to be with you, but it's not just a pleasure. In a certain way, just realize that I wasn't just being generous with my time. I want to be generous with my time with people like you, because I instantly realized when I started talking to you that I was with kindred spirits. And so I learn as much from talking to you as, as, as anything that you might think you learn from talking to me. And I would tell you that this very thing where I realized you guys are Berkshire attendees, you, you love this stuff. You've drunk the Kool-Aid. And uh, so by spending time with you, I get to improve my environment. It's in a certain way quite self-interested. So I was so happy to do it. I'm looking forward to meeting you at Berkshire, looking forward to meeting you at other times. And uh, together, hopefully, we'll become um, uh, wealthier and make the world a better place at the same time. Absolutely. You don't get a better uh, win-win than that. So, okay, uh, really appreciate uh, everyone tuning in. Uh, we've got the best audience out there. We've got the smartest audience out there. So keep your questions coming. Uh, we can't thank everybody enough for what you're doing uh, to help promote our, our brand, our podcast. Uh, if you're enjoying this, please leave us a review on uh, iTunes because that just helps uh, promote it even more. So uh, go out, get Guy's book. It's a fantastic read, The Education of a Value Investor, and uh, we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for listening to The Investor's Podcast. To listen to more shows or access to the tools discussed on the show, be sure to visit www.theinvestorspodcast.com. Submit your questions or request a guest appearance to The Investor's Podcast by going to www.asktheinvestors.com. If your question is answered during the show, you will receive a free autographed copy of the Warren Buffett Accounting Book. 
This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. This material is copyrighted by the TIP network and must have written approval before commercial application. 